After one hour of dashing madly across the Surigao Strait under ceaseless Japanese warplane fire, the three brand new American Sumner class destroyers finally made it to their target, Armak Bay. The damaged destroyers had burst into one of the most heavily defended ports in the Pacific Theater to destroy as many ships, military assets, supply depots, and military men as they could. It was practically a suicide mission. Once there, the state of the art vessels were met by a blistering barrage of enemy fire, unlike most sailors had witnessed in their lives, and were completely engulfed in a haze of shore, sea based, air, and undersea weapons. Soon, a lucky torpedo found its target on USS Cooper, which plummeted into the seabed in less than a minute. But her brave sailors continued fighting, firing at the enemy ships as much as they could before being swallowed by the sea. The chaos was terrifying and all encompassing, but the forgotten Battle of Ormoc Bay, one of the Pacific's fiercest and most crucial engagements, was just beginning. Clash of Giants It had been nearly a month after the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the largest naval battle in history, and the situation in the contested Philippine Islands remained critical. The U.S. had managed to gain a toehold on the eastern half of Leyte, but the Japanese were throwing as many reinforcements and supplies as possible in a defiant bid to keep control of the island. The struggle devolved into a clash between two ambitious generals fueled by their stalwart resolve and sizable egos. On the one hand, the Japanese high command was pressuring General Tomoyuki Yamashita to defend Leyte as if it were his own homeland. If it fell, the Japanese hold over the Philippines would follow. On the other hand, General Douglas MacArthur was eager to keep his lofty vow to the Filipinos, and he was prepared to unleash the entire might of the U.S. military to liberate the archipelago and send the Japanese reeling back into the Northwest Pacific. At first, the Americans were led to believe the Japanese forces were about to withdraw from the island, as the recently broken Purple Code allowed them to intercept messages depicting a massive movement of Japanese convoys. Soon, however, the Americans realized the Japanese were not retreating. In fact, they were increasing the resupply efforts in a massive operation, with Ormoc Bay in its center. After months of scrambling to halt the seemingly endless supply of fresh troops and resources, the U.S. finally had something that could severely cripple the Japanese. Testing the Waters General Tomoyuki Yamashita thought the United States Navy had undergone severe casualties and was susceptible to a counterattack, so he continued to amass his troops. Meanwhile, MacArthur strengthened his forces in the area, convinced that the enemy supply lines could be severed, leading to the fall of Leyte. Ormoc Bay was covered by a wide set of military defenses, ranging from constant air patrols, massive coastal batteries, shore troop presence, and a considerable amount of Japanese destroyers and submarines ready to retaliate. Moreover, the port had restricted access through two narrow channels, one in the northwest under enemy control and another in the south, which was heavily mined. Both were too shallow to allow any vessel larger than a destroyer to pass through, and MacArthur would not be able to rely on the support of his capital ships. Vice Admiral James L. Kaufman, who had just taken over as commander of the Philippine Sea Frontier, was facing intense pressure from General MacArthur to take action and stop Japanese reinforcements from reaching the area. In response, on November 27, 1944, he issued an order to have the Kanagao Channel cleared of mines by the minesweepers USS Pursuit and USS Revenge. It was believed to be the obvious solution. Incursions Once the mines were cleared in the following days, the U.S. executed two incursions into the bay, but the destroyers found no Japanese ships or military activity in the vicinity. In one of the missions, the destroyer USS Waller, aided by a spotting PBY Catalina, dashed into the port unopposed and began pummeling the facilities with their main battery. Incredibly, there was little response. Soon, however, the Catalina spotted a Japanese submarine surfacing nearby, and USS Waller lost no time engaging. A fierce battle ensued, but the submarine was no match for the destroyer and was soon blasted into the bottom of the sea. During two other raids, American PT boats and destroyers managed to pierce the bay and deal some damage, even sinking a Japanese transport ship approaching the port. However, they did not find any significant naval movement either. Everything would change the following day, and Kaufman received an urgent message, alerting him of a massive gathering of enemy ships in the port. The opportunity Kaufman and MacArthur had been waiting for had just presented itself. 
from the factory into the fray. Just in the nick of time, Destroyer Squadron 60 arrived at the anchorage in Uliti Atoll and joined the 7th Fleet. The squadron was unique in that it included seven of the newly designed Sumner-class destroyers. Unlike other modern U.S. destroyers with only two 5-inch mounts forward, the Sumners had four. Additionally, they were the first destroyers to have twin rudders, making them capable of faster turns, a crucial feature in close quarters such as Ormoc Bay. On December 2nd, Commander John C. Zahm was summoned aboard the flagship USS Portland, anchored at San Pedro Bay. Vice Admiral Kaufman handed him a copy of CTG Dispatch 02356, marked Secret. The document ordered him to take his three ships, USS Allen M. Sumner, USS Cooper, and USS Mole, into Ormoc Bay at midnight. He was instructed to destroy any enemy ships on his path and inflict maximum damage to the dock and warehouses. The ships were so new, the paint on their hull was still drying. Moreover, nearly 15% of the sailors and officers assigned to the mission had previous combat experience. Just 15 minutes after setting off, a swarm of Japanese fighters descended from the clouds and began raining fire upon the American destroyers. One of the warplanes was shot down, but the rest continued to harass Zom's forces as they made their way to their target. At 11 p.m., the ship sounded the alarm when they detected another wave of enemy aircraft. A bomber made a close pass on Sumner, puncturing her entire starboard side with 90 holes and starting a fire that made her a much more vulnerable target. The aircraft continued to attack the three ships. Damaged but undeterred, they pushed on until they finally reached the port where the real battle would take place. When the destroyers pierced the bay at 12 a.m. on December 6th, they were welcomed by an unprecedented outpouring of enemy fire from every direction. Packs of Japanese fast PT boats descended on the Americans, shore batteries began to target them from the coastline, and the unrelenting aircraft continued to engage the destroyers continuously. Hell over the waves. Upon encountering the Japanese forces, the American destroyers immediately began to fire back with lethal efficiency. Then, like a well-oiled machine, the three destroyers fired synchronized, targeting a transport ship caught in the middle of disembarking enemy troops. The overwhelming fire proved too much for the enemy transport ship, which burst into flames and began sinking. Most Japanese servicemen never made it to the shore, with some desperately jumping into the sea to avoid the growing flames. After sinking the transport, the three ships concentrated their fire on several depots and cranes across the docks. But soon, they detected the Japanese destroyer Kua trying to make a surprise attack on them. Again, the American destroyers channeled their combined firepower and sank Kua before she was able to escape. The Sumner-class destroyers were performing brilliantly, and it all pointed to a decisive victory. However, the Japanese still had some aces up their sleeves. Many submarines and destroyers that remained close to shore to avoid radar detection suddenly began unleashing their guns and torpedoes on the attackers. A submarine torpedo then slammed into the hull of USS Cooper, carving a massive hole in one of her sides. Torpedo officer Douglas Campbell would later describe the experience, quote, When the Cooper was hit with that shuddering thud that was on the bridge, I was immediately propelled into the water and felt myself being dragged down. I then realized that I was tied to the ship by my sound-powered phone line. Fortunately, I had a sharp knife strapped to my belt, and it came in handy freeing me. I shot toward the surface and came up amid burning debris and oil. Cooper sank in less than a minute, dragging dozens of American sailors to the bottom of the sea, while the rest struggled to swim amid the oil, fire, and debris. The other American ships were too heavily engaged to mount a rescue operation, but continued to suppress the numerous Japanese coastal guns and warships, trying to sink them. Rescue At 12.33 a.m., the two surviving destroyers were ordered to retreat from the bay. The Japanese claimed the battle as a victory, but the American ships had managed to sink several enemy ships, destroy countless military assets, and disrupt a significant supply operation that would weaken the Japanese presence in the region. Meanwhile, the survivors of USS Cooper desperately attempted to swim to a nearby shore, and in an incredibly fortunate turn of events, were spotted by two consolidated PBY Catalina flying boats. The pilots were deeply moved by the sailors' ordeal and refused to leave a single man behind. Instead, the U.S. airmen threw out everything that was not vital and instructed the survivors to do the same with their gear, including their shoes. Significantly surpassing their flight capacity, 
the Catalinas carried up to 59 sailors each. Incredibly, they were able to take off and save the stranded sailors. The fearless pilots were eventually rewarded with the medal for their bravery and determination. The engagement would become the only battle at sea during the war that saw the deployment of every type of weapon in the enemy's arsenal, including naval artillery, torpedoes, airstrikes, submarine assaults, coastal artillery, and mines. The Invasion Zom's suicide mission had been a bittersweet affair. They had lost hundreds of sailors and a destroyer, but caused unmeasurable damage to the enemy and their capability to reinforce Leyte. Now it was time for MacArthur to make his next move. The US deployed a massive amphibious and air operation to kick the Japanese while they were down, and on the evening of December 6th, approximately 8,000 soldiers from the 77th Division boarded several types of small landing vessels. Under cover of darkness, they navigated around the southern edge of Leyte and reached Ormoc Bay by dawn. They then landed in Deposito, a small village five miles south of Ormoc City, which placed them behind enemy lines. Meanwhile, the 7th Infantry Division advanced from the south along the coast, while the 11th Airborne Division moved down from the north towards Ormoc City. By then, General Yamashita had hastily reinforced the bay, and close to 40,000 Japanese soldiers were in the area. Thankfully for the Americans, they were disorganized, depleted, and with a great deal of demolished infrastructure. As such, they were unable to mount a defensive operation. The Japanese made several efforts to resupply their positions, but they were defeated every time, and soon the American forces were able to secure Ormoc Bay and the city. From there, the fall of Leyte was just a matter of time. Thank you for watching Dark Seas. If you want to delve into the subsequent American defeat at Bataan, check out our Dark Docs video on the matter. Otherwise, click on your screen and explore our other Dark Documentaries channels for the most thrilling warfare anecdotes and fascinating military news. We publish new content regularly, so stay tuned.